Right. Uh, brilliant. Uh, Christian, uh, thanks a lot for being on the Innovation Civil Lodge podcast. What a pleasure to have you here today. Well, thank you for having me. Brilliant. And uh, Mo Harris, uh, welcome as well. Hello. Brilliant. All right. Um, let's get cracking then. Um, Christian, you've lived um, a long life in terms of very eclectic experiences. You know, you start off, you know, I hear with Egyptology, writing 10 different books, you know, on like 40 different discoveries. Uh, and then you moved on to artificial intelligence. Can you quickly give us a, your background a little, you know, I'm sure I did the summary, but it's, uh, it doesn't do any justice. <laughs> well, uh, I'm a former Egyptologist, but I come from a family where there was never any Egyptologist or in fact, any scholar. We, I come back, I come from a family of, of rulers, politicians on the one hand and traders on the other side. So being an Egyptologist is, is the odd thing. And in fact, I, my father was an engineer and I grew up in a, uh, you know, in the technology world. My, my first job at the age of 12 was in the, uh, you know, uh, consultancy of my father, which was a, called at the time Chemical Development Corporation. And it was about you know, oil and catalysts and, you know, and, and this is how I got my first paycheck, not as an Egyptologist, but as a, someone who was actually compiling numbers and showing secretaries that they were wrong. Mm. This is what my father was very happy to show them that the 12 year old could calculate better than them. <laughs> and which didn't yeah. make it, you know, it was not, uh, you know, entirely uh, pleasant for me because, but, but the fact is, yes, I grew up in, in this atmosphere of engineering. And uh, we're also the souvenir of my grandfather, who was a politician. And before that, uh, we had a, uh, a long history in the Ottoman Empire and Garbach, which is, as you know, a, a topic of, uh, yeah. of the news right now. It's in the middle so, of the war yes. now, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. now uh, I've been an Egyptologist for, I think, uh, from the age of before five. So I was four, so I'm 58. Uh, imagine 54 years. Um, well, I stopped when I was 52 and I've been, uh, yeah, 48 years in Egyptologist, very young. And I got world press when I was 23 and many more discoveries, but I, I'm jumping a bit there. Maybe you want me to ask, you want to ask me, you know, <laughs> specific yeah, no worries. And, um, today you're, you're doing more of artificial intelligence, uh, and the AI and blockchain with the, with the UK government. Yeah. Is that, I have my own scope? company. Yeah, yeah, I have my own company called Projectis. In fact, mm -hmm. Projectis until now was Projectis Consultants. And I'm very happy to say that literally as from, you know, the past few days and particularly today is Projectis <laughs> Technology because um, I've actually created my own blockchain myself today. I finished it and my partners, you're the first one to learn because my partners don't even know. But m with my partner, we've, I've all, we've also, I've, I've also created a, a blockchain solution for certification of documents and uh, it's been coded by another company and it's going to be sold by my main partner who is market with and uh, and this is you know we're waiting to see our first client so yes it's a big leap from egyptology to technology but not so much because even as an egyptologist for example i'm one of the few egyptologists mm. in the world who has actually baked egyptian blue and Egyptian blue uh, is the first, mm. as far as we know, synthetic process invented by humanity. But basically, what is it? It's a pigment. You can find it um, in a natural state in only two places in the world, as far as I know. One is the Vesuvio in Italy, and the other one is a Mexican volcano. Volcano. In, in its natural form, it's called cuprorevite, uh, a mm. very rare mineral. You never, you probably would never have heard about it. And it's extremely even difficult for someone who collects minerals to find, you know, bits of it. But uh, in, you can actually create cuprorevite by baking malachite with soda. And basically, when uh, you put the, the, the mixture of this in, in an oven, it goes in green and comes out blue. And it's an extraordinary process. And how the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, discovered this technology you know, more than three or 4,000 years ago is a total mystery because the temperature needs to be very high, constant. And how mm. do you achieve this with, mm. you know, clay ovens is, is magical. I mean, it's, you can imagine like in Japan, they were masters. Like in Japan, you can have cl cloisonné vases 
which require an immense knowledge, an immense mm. you know, capacity to master the element, um, you know, to bake ancient Egyptian blue with a kiln and some fire made out of, you know, uh, base wood is, is, is an extraordinary achievement, really. I mean, I suppose, Christian, one of the <clears throat> interesting things about the ancient world is the technology or the sort of hidden technologies, you know, the sort of Greek fire and all, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. It, it is, you know, what, what are some of the technologies? Obviously, you mentioned one there, but in ancient Egypt, the building, the engineering, the yeah. astronomy, what, what are some of the technologies or sciences that there's evidences for that kind of really, really impress you about them? Well, as I said, Egyptian blue is, is historically the oldest, and first synthetic process. You just mentioned the Greek fire, which in French is called feu grégeois, where the secret of which was kept for, for a long time because it gave the Byzantine army uh, an edge. It was a terrible weapon, actually. It was a, it, it's a fire, it, it was a, a sort of bitumen that would actually burn in the sea and even on the water. I mean, it's, it's the, the damages it would cause. And, and the and everything rest was about war back then. Years, yeah. yeah. And um, mm -hmm. then there was the um, uh, distillation. Distillation, the Sumerian possibly invented it. I've discovered myself, and I've never published it, that in fact, ancient Egyptian did it 1,000 years earlier than we think. I mean, I think maybe we think the world, excuse me, I'll, I'll put the, the phone off. No, I should have. I should have turned my my phone up. This is my fault. No, <laughs> no, je peux pas te parler, chérie, pas maintenant. No, yeah. Sorry about that. It's always like this, isn't it? Right. Okay. Right. So where was I? Distillation. <laughs> it was um, it was my daughter, my 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 you know twelve year old. Nice. <laughs> always calls at the um, most appropriate moment. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Distillation, as I said, um, the Roman, you know used it and Egyptians used it but I think I can't remember what the earliest date for it uh, is but I've actually I actually understood that it was um, used by ancient Egyptian at least a thousand years before Roman time and and then um, there was um, my brain is going now completely disturbed with this phone call <laughs> um, well, I suppose as a, as just as a, she's really like just torpedoed my mind for a second. No, of course. Well, I suppose maybe just another question: Are there any theories among archaeologists or people who study the ancient world about why different civilizations seem to focus on different technologies? So, you know, the Greeks, the Romans, they they all had technology and they all did similar things, but they all seem to have different specialisms, or the culture seem to have been obsessed with a different type of technology. Is there is there any sort of views on, on why that happens? Well, you know, it was a question of exchange, really. And um, information traveled much, much faster than we think that, you know, we don't realize that, you know, that Roman roads first, but, but then much before that, um, you know, sea exchanges, with, you know, the Phoenicians and the Greeks literally were, were great sailors. And um, Phoenicians are said to be the first to do the circumnavigation of Africa. And uh, it may be true uh, until we discover uh, something else. But it's true that the Egyptians sent uh, expeditions to the, the land of called of Punt, the, the location of which is still a matter of debate. But basically, they went beyond the fourth, fifth and sixth cataract deep into Africa. And the fact is that there is a word for ebony. The word ebony is ancient Egyptian hebenoi. It's as simple, it's simple as that. It, it's from Central Africa, where you have you find the, the the ebony tree, and then it was brought to Egypt, where you I, I read it in ancient Egyptian hebony, hebenoi, and then mm. it, it passed in the Greek and then the Latin, and we we still use it today. And and so you know uh, when the technology is useful, people learn very very quick, very quickly, you know about it and. And writing also, we, we think writing uh, was born out of exchanges. That's the reverse, actually. Uh, writing was born out of uh, accountancy. And that connects also to blockchain. We can, we can talk about that. Mm. But um, the fact is, um, uh, it was useful. They needed to calculate and, and record things. And if you look at the labels in Yarkompolis, uh, which are the oldest uh, example of, of ancient Egyptian signs, you find them on labels for goods that were put in the tombs of the pharaohs or the nobles who were buried in this area. 
and it's out thereafter they needed to say more about the product on the label and then and the language evolved and and in Schumer it's in, in for the Sumerian it's exactly mm. the same thing you see that language evolves from their tokens their accounting tokens and and and, and from for accounting because in Sumerian a uh, state had an extremely sophisticated administration and they had canals they had a good moving on the canals they had a very very heavy administration like the egyptians and the tradition i mean uh, today is, is somewhat different but uh, uh, accountancy uh, continues to this day in egypt um, in fact a lot of people think that uh, if you, everything still exists in egypt about you know if there is any paper concerning anything that's been recorded it is somewhere in Egypt. It's kept, in, including Bonaparte's uh, archives, I know, are kept in the, in the corner of Cairo, um, unaccessible, or sometime accessible. And I've heard stories in the 80s and 90s. Everything is there. The question is to find it. Yeah. That's pretty interesting, actually. And since we're talking about ancient Egypt and ancient Egyptian innovations, I guess one of the biggest feats of innovation were clearly the pyramids, right? And I'm sure as an Egyptologist, you spend a fair amount of your time uh, in and around the, the pyramids, basically. Um, so like, w w what do you think about the engineering techniques, basically, that were used during the building of the pyramids? You know, like I look at some of the engineering work that we do today, you know, and it's, it's, it's okay. You know, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, but this word we're talking about like thousands of years ago, right. You know, imagine like them actually, you know, doing such immense feats of work. Um, what's your take on the level of engineering prowess basically that the Egyptians had, um, vis-a-vis -vis some of the other civilizations that even occurred later, you know, uh, than them, basically. And, and what do you basically make of the, that? You know, how did they acquire that? How did they, like, is that even uh, possible, basically, right? Yes, well, it's, uh, you know, pyramids and how they were built is a big topic in Egyptology. In fact, my first book, one which still remains unpublished, was about pyramids. I wrote it when I was 18, mm -hmm. 17, 18. And it has Incredible. been published for, for, you know, various reasons. So I know the topic uh, quite quite well. Uh, Maybe after this episode, yeah. Yes, yes, but um, <laughs> it's a debate. It's an ongoing debate. There's yes. always someone every every year. There is a pyramidologist who is not a professional or a professional who comes with a new solution. I mean, recently I've heard that the, you know some some of the stones of Cheops pyramid are in concrete, and then you know. It's it's one of those things, and you need to be on site. You need to be to have professionals with uh, precise technologies to verify what, what you know what is said. And um, the fact is, um, there is no definite answer, as far as I know. It's one of those topics where you know we need more evidence. The sure thing is that the pyramids themselves express the level of technology, the the, the level of. Uh, of architecture, uh, architectural knowledge that the ancient Egyptian had at that point. But you can also verify it by simply looking at the solar bark, you know, the one that has been excavated because there are, you know, there's two or three around mm. the pyramid of Cheops. And, and one thing that struck me when I visited the, the you know, the solar bark of, you know, uh, along the uh, left hand side of the pyramid of Cheops and for which a museum was built. You know, it was built around it. it. Is and when you look at it, and it's dated 2400 BC approximately, you understand the level of of technology, you know, and nautical knowledge and mathematical knowledge that the Egyptian had reached 4400 years ago already. It is just totally bewildering. I mean, if they are capable of doing of building such a big, you know, uh, sailing boat um, at that time, it, this doesn't come. Um, you know, this sort of knowledge you do not acquire in five minutes. You acquire it perhaps rapidly. It can, it, this is possible in one century or two, but it, it's it's certain that it, it probably comes from a long tradition of boat building in ancient Egypt or somewhere mm. else. I mean, it, uh, Egyptologists ignore this all the time, but, but the fact is there are traces and illusions that Sumerian influences mm. at the very, uh, during very early period of ancient Egypt um, occurred. 
And um, well, that's for future Egyptologists to look at and, and assemble the evidence. And yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure if you've come across the works of Graham Hancock, basically, who wrote uh, a few books like yourself, basically on this topic as well. And on the note of um, the pyramids and the building of the pyramids, what he describes is an ancient apocalypse, you know, um, so an ancient sort of civilization, which is super highly advanced did reside on on earth then some apocalyptic event happened and traces of some of those um, you know technological knowledge remained and the egyptians simply you know took that or built upon that and stuff like that i was wondering like w what's your sort of thoughts on this basically as well well every every period has a cataclysmist or a revisionist mm. and graham mm. hancock is one and before him, mm. there was, in, at the time when I was at the Institute of Archaeology, around in, in the 80s, mid 80s, there were, you know, everybody was talking about Emmanuel Velikovsky, who was also uh, a cataclysmist, you know, and, and I, I just checked today as, as a matter of interest, and Graham Hancock actually validates part of what mm. Velikovsky said. Uh, the common point between the two is that there are no professionals. There are mm. one is a, uh, a soci sociologist, that's Graham Hancock. The other one was a psychanalyst. And the thing about not being a professional and not having been trained, uh, you know, with and spent years learning about the, the structure of uh, and the data concerning archaeology is that you're constantly on the edge of ignorance and the edge mm. of missing something which is important, or you don't have the right frame of mind to see the overall picture and have this specialist knowledge that makes you a professional. So it's, it's not a coincidence that both of them were not trained archaeologists. Now, is it, are we to dismiss them as easily as professional archaeologists do? I don't think so, as a matter of fact. I think it's quite healthy that some people think differently, challenge the accepted knowledge, and they shouldn't be excluded because Velikovsky, for example, was banned. He couldn't even go on the campuses of some universities. He couldn't publish when, in fact, he was one of the founders of the uh, Hebrew, uh, uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And he corresponded with Albert Einstein and, and he was doing some good work in some areas. And he was a, a student of one of the students of Freud, etc., etc. But yes, uh, some professionals w are intrigued by what they read which doesn't fit what they understand but also they don't have the 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 the, 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 the specialist knowledge to distinguish what could be fantasy and not and at that mm -hmm. point since we were talking about pyramids at, uh, at that frontier you you, you often have uh, pyramidologists there are many of them appearing every year who says how do you prove that it is not the aliens who built the pyramids sure. and that's yeah. and that's yeah, yeah, well, of course, uh, you know, uh, but the, f the fact is the evidence suggests that it's very unlikely that the aliens built the pyramids, mm -hmm. but they tried to find correlations and finding correlation. I mean, uh, I was watching beginning of this program again, just before uh, connecting, just just as a matter of interest. Um, whenever he talked about Egypt and flew in my airspace, I could sense that he didn't know what, really what he was talking about. And I suppose it's the same for um, Indonesia and Java and, and whatever. But the fact is, he actually raises questions and, and it's interesting. And archaeologists, I mean, the thing about his program is there's a lot of him uh, on, you know, on different angles, but I do not see many archaeologists who actually would question his theories being invited. I haven't looked at everything, but it's, it's typical. It's typical. And in my time, the archaeologists who were actually, who adhered in the 80s to Veliskovsky theory um, happened to be the, 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 the mediocres, those who actually uh, had no ideas of them for the, you know, uh, themselves and in fact disappeared and vanished from archaeology. Um, they tried to thrive on some extraordinary uh, theory, the revision of the chronology of the Dark Age, etc. And that's one of the things that they he was trying to, to, to say that there was a hiatus. Oh. We had, we had an Would you say, though, that um, some of these revisionist theories have value, for instance, um, the, f the f discovery of Gubekli Tepe in Turkey, uh, I hear, has basically pushed back our thinking that, okay, agriculture existed like, you know, a couple of three to 4,000 years before we initially thought. Megalithic yeah. structures existed 
three to 4,000 years before we thought, right? Um, and I, I don't know, like, as we dig deeper into the Earth's crust and stuff like that, will we have more data points to suggest actually advanced human thinking is actually more older than we actually thought? Because science is a is, is, is an effort in constantly kind of, you know, re having new hypotheses and having data points disprove that hypothesis, right? Um, so do you, do you think that some of these theories are being validated with some of the evidence that we're basically seeing like Ubekla Tepe? Well, I don't know about this particular site. I, I, I knew yeah. uh, very well uh, Jimmy Mellard, James Mellard, who discovered Chatel Huyuk, who is, which is one of the most mm -hmm. extraordinary uh, archaeological site in the world. The dates are just incredible. I think it's six to 8,000 BC from memory. But the, the short thing, when Chatel Huyuk was discovered, it literally pushed the boundaries of our knowledge of the development of the Near East by several thousands of years. And, and everything was different. Everything is different because of Chatel Huyuk, which is still excavated as, as we speak here. Um, the, 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 I think it's a question of approach. You should not dismiss easily any new idea, but you need to approach it in a very scientific manner and have the evidence. And um, I think one of the criticisms uh, for Mr. Hancock is that he doesn't actually convince, his evidence doesn't convince it. Uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe not, maybe it will trigger someone to discover something else. But um, we can't just uh, also be linear, that is many scholars uh, are very linear in the way they want archaeology to evolve. But archaeology, yeah. like science, evolves in leaps and, 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 and returns and twists and, you know, goes backwards mm. and forwards. That's, that's the nature of uh, knowledge acquisition and, in fact, of human history. There's not a linear yeah. evolution of how civilizations evolve. It's, it's mm. a back and forth movement, constant, in fact, between mm. nations. You were talking about um, technologies, uh, you know, being exchanged, but ideas walls, uh, you know, uh, Egyptian would conquer Lebanon, they would bring back the wood, yes, but also knowledge about plants and different, uh, you know, um, even the writing system at one point landed in Sinai or etc. or the reverse, perhaps. But yeah, exchanges are extremely uh, important. And in fact, one of my colleague, uh, um, Professor Richard Wilkinson, who is the vice, uh, uh, you know, dean of uh, you know, Arizona State University, has created a, a, a journal called the Journal of Ancient Egyptian Interconnections that was in, in the mid, uh, around 2010, which deals with this sort of problem because Egyptology was very close and is still very close to, mm -hmm. to, to understanding the exchanges. So he created that journal, which is a success, and, and, and I've contributed to it because it's a question of enlarging our, our views. And I published mm -hmm. an article about... Uh, um, the name of an ancient Egyptian plant called Gash, which comes straight from India, literally from right. Sanskrit. And it traveled That's through the ancient Egyptian vocabulary. Uh, you know, I can't remember the dates now, but very early on, perhaps uh, Middle Kingdom or Kingdom, I can't remember. Um, I, I, I suppose a question that I mean, we've talked about how technologies come, why they're essential to countries, but why, why do we lose technologies? Because obviously you have the apocalyptics like, you know, Graham Hancock, you say, nature comes and wipes it out but what are some of the theories around you know why did we forget how to build pyramids for example like how, how would the, do the people just die out or where, how do we lose technology because there are many ways to do things this is true for roman concrete we we still don't know how they made the concrete that can even resist the seawater and what i was going to say before my daughter interrupted us you know on, on is that I've actually found two out of three ingredients of how to do ancient Egyptian varnish. And then th this, this tripartite formula passed into the classic literature and then into the Renaissance. And then in the Renaissance, it continued to be used by master of the Ren Renaissance, but the in original ingredients in ancient Egypt um, uh, disappear, uh, the, the knowledge disappeared. So we knew there was, there was wax. And I discovered that there was um, pistachia resin, resin and turpentine from the ancient Egyptian. Thing. And I, I haven't, I just published a little thing on this one, those things again, which I, I could have published in more detail. But yes, I did publish it and um, announced that it, it was uh, discovered. But we, we actually 
uh, until 2009 and 10, we had forgotten of how ancient Egyptian varnishes were made, and that prevented us to understand why uh, many sarcophagi of museum were turning yellow. Because if you use pistachia resin, it, it, the oxidization of the sun's ray turns a translucent resin into a yellow varnish. So the 21st dynasty sarcophagi, which are yellow, are not yellow originally. It's because they were exposed at one point to some, some light, perhaps after they were excavated, and the oxidization of the resin makes them yellow. They were not originally. Yeah. And, yeah, and we, that... If you don't know the ingredients, you can't. And this discovery was important for conservative people, you know, taking care of, of conserving these, these pieces, because now that they know that the pistachia resin, they can do the chemistry to preserve and, and return the, the sarcophagus. To its I mean, the, the conspiracy theorist in me wonders whether that's a sort of anti-theft device, you know, <laughs> like sort of, you know, the sarcophagus has been taken out because it's turned yellow. <laughs> I'm not sure whether well, they thought of that. Of, uh, of, uh, of theories about everything. And it's, the question is always, to the, some of it can be true, but uh, most of it very often, particularly when it doesn't come from professionals, is groundless and, and, and you know, without any evidence. That's the difference, really. Yeah, and, and are you saying, by the way, that we fully understand the pyramid making process? No, we don't. With today's evidence? No, no, absolutely okay. not. Okay. No, no. Okay. Uh, absolutely so that's interesting. Not. Every year, every year, someone comes with something different. And, right, and right, okay. And and, new, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's quite interesting, the, basically. The most accepted version is yeah. the one I've heard is about ramps going around the pyramid, and maybe. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I knew okay, a lot okay. about, and I know a lot about the architecture of pyramids. That's the actual facts yeah. of how they are made and their evolution. Uh, yeah. About the technologies involved in their construction, it's an yeah. endless debate. Yeah, mm. yeah, that's quite interesting. Basically, as a premise, that you've got this technology which is like you know thousands of years old, um, and still where uh, like humans struggle to understand, you know how and why and, and whatever do you think that we're entering a similar period or type of technology with artificial intelligence today where some of the llms you know when you actually make them and then train them it's it's really hard to predict the output you know it's quite unpredictable and it's very hard to understand as well how those you know weights and functions quite work out uh do you think it's it's, it's quite similar um, you know, that basically it's, it's also quite a black boxy type thing where it's a artificial intelligence is also quite hard to understand. Well, for my, I use artificial intelligence every day. I've used it again this morning, whether it's being chat, but, and for, for practical reasons, calculations and, and programming and, and, and you name it. Um, I think you, you can harness the, the, the beast for the time being, you can, you can ask them and they behave more and more. In, in a human way. In fact, my post on LinkedIn today is about the fact I asked Bob whether it thought uh, that it would uh, get to a point where we could not distinguish, could not know whether it was human or not. And it says, yes, it, it answered, yes, I'm getting to a point where uh, another human being will not be able to know whether mm. I'm human or not. It's so, and, and whether it's conscious or not is, is, is almost not important to be at that point, because if it's <laughs> behaving exactly like a human being and, and to the point that we can't distinguish it, it's, it's a real fundamental question. Now, where this is going to evolve is, is the big question. And how much power are we going to allow the AIs to have is, is, an, is, is a big question. Um, I, it's quite clear that the, the power we already have on a daily basis is just extraordinary. It's changing everything. It's changing my company's, uh, you know, directions and, and creativity and everything else. Um, now, whether we should be scared uh, about it, well, you know, you can be scared uh, about the fusion of the atom and uranium and nuclear bombs when we've been, you know, living with these new technologies for decades. Should we not be scared? I don't know, because when you know that uh, Mr. Putin had thousands of nuclear warheads, we could be scared on a daily basis, but we, could, we can be scared of everything and including crossing the street. So the question is more trying to harness the problem, control and, and anticipate what it could do. This is why I've been mm. one, you know, among those who, I don't want AI to be in this country regulated too fast, particularly to allow mm. SMEs 
uh, to develop. But I definitely want regulations on matters of national security, whether it's, uh, mm. you know, uh, anything touching the military or our children's security or our security. That's the, exactly the reverse. Uh, you know, and legislation should come very, very fast. Or, uh, for example, uh, facial recognition, which is now mm. an issue because uh, the police is using it basically as an alternative to ID cards. And ID cards have never been welcome in this country and are not. And in fact, I'm one of those who just signed with Lord Clement Jones and others the petition um, to have the matter discussed in Parliament. And I, I haven't checked, but we were not far from 50,000 signatures, which, as you know, when it reached that, that number, then it will be debated in Parliament. So it's a question of understanding and balancing and, and, and following the evolution. But it is extremely exciting to, to be able to, uh, what, what incredible help I got this week from artificial intelligence using the different, uh, you know, language models. It's, it's, it's just extraordinary, really. The world is already not the same. Some people I know don't know about this. Uh, the general public doesn't realize. But the world is already a very, very different place, particularly for professionals in technology. Mm. Yeah, definitely. You, yeah. Do you think that creates the risk, though, of us kind of using technology mindlessly or sort of not being aware of its its effects on us or even in a doomsday scenario, creating technologies that we can't manage because they're just too black boxed and we, we don't understand how to sort of unpick them, particularly well, with the AI? Well, the two, two uh, chemists who specialize in, uh, in, in you know, um, uh, I think uh, I can't remember what the specialization was exactly, but I know that they ran, they asked AI to create dangerous molecules and, and they let the, the system run for a few hours. And at the end of it, there were several thousands of deadly, you know, SARS like molecule or others. And they, they really got scared and they thought we can't keep that for ourselves. And, and they just, if you look on the internet, it's everywhere because they realized the, the power of destruction that can be, that be, can be, um, attached to the development of AI, what they, they flagged it and now people are looking into it. It's like anything, really. I mean, we anyone can also, you know, develop all sorts of chemical weapons at home with uh, base supermarket uh, uh, products or a bit of chemistry and so on. Whether we do it or not is another is another question. And, and the context, the, the geopolitical context of one's country uh, it, it helps or doesn't help this sort of you know, evolutions. I mean, of course, uh, I'm, I'm sure that in Ukraine right now, they're looking into any possibility uh, to destroy the Russian army. Uh, and and they've, do they've, they've done it because uh, factually their, 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 you know, their drones have actually are, are seemingly checking the very mighty and powerful Russian Navy. And, and this is incredible. But the, and, and Garba was mainly lost because of drones and and, and these new technologies. Israeli technology lended to the Azeris, used with great efficiency by the Azeri army, when the Armenians didn't, you know, were, were not uh, updated on, on this new type of warfare. So yes, you can, you can and, and also uh, weapons without, uh, you know, uh, self-sufficient AI-driven weapons. I've written an article for the Financial Times about this, you know, which the Financial Times published a letter and which they transform in an article about the fact that we can't, you know, from a moral point of view, we shouldn't allow a self-sufficient um, uh, AI weapons to develop. Now, the answer of mi the military is that we need to keep up with what the others are doing. And then and then it's the endless circle of increase of you know, weaponry, budget, money, market. I mean, you know, big companies making money and, and you know. I mean, I, I suppose it's a bit like the advent of the atom bomb, isn't it? When you sort of had Oppenheimer who thought, I've created yeah. a technology that anybody can now destroy the world from their basement sort of thing. Um, well, and, and of yes. course, yeah, the, the world was a very dangerous period for a long time. But then eventually, I think nations came to an agreement that it's yeah. in our mutual interest to regulate this together to some yeah, extent. Well, yeah, to what I was asking, I think there should be a, a treaty of non-proliferation of, of AI-driven mm. weapons. And, uh, yeah. and I think the FT understood that very well, and they published my letter precisely for this because they, yeah. they realized how dangerous it is. But there will always be people who only look at their self-interest and, and the profit they can make out of this new business. And of course, a soldier thinks like a soldier. A soldier wants more powerful weapon, and this is what his job is. But the job of the politician is to tell him, well, you know what? No, we'd rather have less weapons for the peace of everybody and, and the security of the world. 
Um, I mean, the world was a very, very violent place throughout the, the past several thousands of, uh, of years. If you look at the Middle Age, it was awful what was happening in this country mm. where I sit and, and where yeah. in, in Europe. So on the one hand, yes, we're scared about these technologies, but there is an awareness, whether it's for the planet's environment or for the future of our children, because, because of podcasts like the one you're doing right now, knowledge is spread. People mm. reflect and they want to act. And the, the capacity to act is now, you know, is not anymore in the hands of a few. Millions of people have the capacity on a daily basis to do good in this world by supporting NGOs. By, it wasn't the case up to 100 years ago. People just didn't know where to start to do good. In fact, they were too busy tilling the soil for most of us in, in Europe. You know, agriculture was the main occupation. And, and you know, the, in the world is a completely different place. Now, hobbies in this country and in France amount to every person almost in this country has a hobby. And, and that is, uh, by hobby, it can be something which is just, uh, you know, for one's personal interest, but it's also, also being part of an NGO protecting the butterflies in your local area and that sort of thing. This didn't exist even several decades ago. The world is mm. very different as we moan and complain of fear, but we forget about, you know, that after the First World War, uh, there was the Spanish flu, which wiped out millions and, and you know, made my great-grandmother, in a, 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 having lost her, her, her husband at Verdun uh, and with two children in Versailles in this cold, cold winter of 1918-19 with no food, Spanish flu. And, and it, it is, we, we forget about the, all of this, you know, and, and ra rations after the Second World War and so on and so on. But we have new, new problems like with the COVID and, 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 you know, because the world is a smaller place, because viruses can travel at the speed of light between one corner to the other in a matter of hours, we need to adapt. We, we, we need to understand. We need to, to be conscious of where we stand at this point in history to be able to forecast what's, what's going to come. And, and even for the best politicians, it's very difficult forecasting anything. It's, it's, it's very problematic. We, you are, you are, one of the questions that you, you listed is, uh, will the United States disappear one day? Well, uh, ultimately everything disappears, I'm afraid. You know, it's only a matter of time. It's, a, it's, a, it's what time frame are we talking about? And, and if it's a question mm. of time frame, yes, yes, civilizations disappear yeah. one way or another and they transform. But I think in, in, instead of talking about uh, disappearance, we can talk about transformation. AI mm. is about to transform the world like, like we've never seen but in a factual way, but it could be the good way. It could be a good way. And I wish it because the United States with its social disparities and its economic problem and the fracture which is increasing between the you know, middle America and the rest could indeed get to a point of, of, if not civil war, at least secession of some states, for example, from the federal system. That's not impossible. Yeah. Or, you know, people who would want to follow Trump for a, in an adventure. I mean, a, a war of secession has happened in, in America, and those who think that nothing can happen again are completely wrong because uh, history repeats yeah. it very often. But uh, I, I, I pray that this doesn't happen. But if action is not taken to preserve democracy and the welfare of people, ultimately it leads to, you know, people like Mr. Putin or Mr. Trump, uh, you know, uh, or even Mr. Boris Johnson to take advantage of the situation. And even worse, Mussolini's and Adolf Hitler's who thrive on the misery of post-war situations like we saw after the First World War. I mean, if the French had not humiliated the, the German as they did, Mr. Hitler would not have gone anywhere. But the anger, the resentment, the poverty, fuels the extremism in every form. Mm. And this is how wars and, and conflicts. Uh, and I suppose as a question, do you think AI and blockchain and these technologies risk making these divisions worse or could, could they be a, a solution to them? I mean, we already see in America, if you work in the tech sector, you can earn a huge high salary. Whereas if you work in, I don't know, coal mining or in the, in, in the rust belt, um, those places obviously switched from the Democrats to Trump because they've sort of collapsed. So, are these technologies potentially going to make it worse? How, how, do, we pre how do we prevent them making it worse? <laughs> you know. Well, blockchain for a start in Africa is helping, uh, because of the cryptocurrencies, is cre helping create local economies. And even there is, uh, I can't remember the name, that crypto that Nigerians are using, it has a parity with the dollar and allows them to send money from here, from the United Kingdom to Nigeria and back. 
So there's mm. a good side of it. And in, in a area where, you know, uh, having a bank account and uh, having access to bank is, is not always possible. So decentralization of the financial system across telephones, whereby you can actually pay your neighbor just by sending a crypto from one phone to another. Um, this is a great benefit of the blockchain technology to the African continent and contribute to its evolution. Now, for America, yes, of course, um, Mr. Altman and, 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 you know, Mr. Musk uh, would love to see an AI agency in the United States because it would certainly be easier for them to first uh, uh, sort of wash their hands of the responsibility of what they've created. But also, you know, imagine creating an AI agency with, like in Europe, thousands of pages of regulations, and then you clamp on the competition because all the SMEs will not be able to compete with the great companies. So because, uh, if not yeah. uh, reading the legal text and understanding it and paying the, 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 the solicitors, lawyers to, to deal with that, well, this is the privilege of big companies. And that's exactly what happened is happening in the EU right no, they produce this several thousands of pages of regulation before Europe has even one single AI ca capable of being a rival to that in uh, those in Silicon Valley. I mean, they pr they they've put literally the chariot, the, the carriage in front of the the ox, you know, or, uh, as uh, as the French would say, and uh, because. Um, three or four thousand pages of text, and then and then no nothing to show for. It. Well. The, even the CEOs of large companies are saying to Brussels, but you, you're completely mad. You, you're destroying the, 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 the possibility mm. for us to do anything. Now, add to this, uh, President Macron uh, has the brilliant idea that all uh, uh, French AI algorithm, uh, all uh, AI algorithm made in France should be in French to promote the francophonie. Uh, it's like shooting <laughs> yourself in the foot because basically, you know, if companies have to program things in French, well, it's not the rest of the world that's gonna, that's gonna use them. So on the one hand, a uh, heavy regulation, on the other hand, uh, a text in the foreign language that most people in this world don't understand. It's, it's not the proper way, but no, it's, it's a question to answer, to go back to your original question. It's a, it's a question of how we can make it, make the people benefit. And I think it's already extraordinary that, in, in effect, uh, to, to be fair, that Google and Microsoft and, and other companies are, are putting, um, you know, are making available to us the incredible power of their language models in Bing Chat, you know, stability, uh, clothes and, 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 you know, and, and Bard. It's, it's uh, where it's extraordinary. Uh, yeah. I suppose just one other question for, for me on, on just on this is you can see different states taking different approaches. I mean, the United States' history is all about free enterprise and risk ventures, etc. And China is taking this very state driven model. And I presume in between people are taking all sorts of different flavors. Do you think that's how countries will approach this? As some will say it's state driven and owned and others will allow AI to explode. And what are some of the differences you're seeing there in terms of well, approaches? Well, we have four, four schools right now. So let's start from the East. The Chinese uh, have, uh, you know, uh, are allowing companies to develop their AI without too much state intervention, but on one condition, that any AI algorithm encompasses socialist values. This is, that's there. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. In Europe, they decided to do the UA, EU AI Act and, and crush everybody on the thousands of pages of regulation. So zero Before innovation. <laughs> in the UK, we have a completely, a third approach, which a lot of people, even in this country, not everybody agrees, but the government's position, and it's also my conclusion, we should not regulate from top to bottom, but let you know, from the bottom, AI grow, create uh, 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 rules, rules which can be tra uh, of practice, which can be transformed in standards. We're very good at selling our standards in the UK. We sold for five hundred and seventy-six million pounds last year, or something like this. And then, from these standards, ultimately regulate when we really understand what's going on. And and that seems to be a very reasonable approach. Except the difference is uh, the difference I have with the government that where at least I don't know what it's really doing right now. And there will be a very big meeting in Bleachy Park very soon is about, as I said earlier, national security. For me, we need to do something. And then the Americans are not sure what they want to do. They're debating it. The Senate and Congress are not in agreement to what should be done. Uh, but then there was a private hearing of, in the Senate, I think, uh, with senators, um, uh, with behind closed doors, where Mr. Musk and Mr. Altman, I don't know, Mr. Zuckerberg was there, about what should be done, which infuriated a lot of people because that sort of debate should be 
uh, mm. public. But basically, with the general idea of creating an AI agency in the US, and Senator Rosenberg, uh, uh, Blumenthal, I don't remember his name, Blumenthal, um, yeah, Blumenthal, uh, who is very experienced, um, uh, warned about the creation of AI, a, of any agency, because it, it's, unless it's extremely well funded and, and controlled, it tends to do exactly the opposite of what it's meant to be. So that was one warning. But now I've seen his later paper and he seems to rally this sort of idea. So maybe we're going to see the United States of America make the mistake, in my opinion, to create an AI agency that will not benefit most uh, most companies. Now, again, they may uh, 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 take a more balanced approach where things which are dangerous should be regulated. But I don't think so. I think it's a question, well, maybe a question of stages. We'll see. In any case, they haven't yet decided and mm. they haven't come up with a US AI Act. But you know what, Christian, in terms of the standards you talked about, which is your sort of approach that you're kind of advising the government of the UK, um, are are we planning to enforce these standards? Like, wh what do you mean by standards? Standards of what exactly? And is this well, enforceable, you have not enforceable? British standards, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. British standards are, okay. are, are used across the world. Why? Because uh, BSI and any institution that regulates mm -hmm. the, the standards. In this country, there's a long tradition mm -hmm. of, of good practice and, and regulated practice. This is very much an English approach to, mm -hmm. to, to, to the problem. We like uh, older. Yeah, it helps, um, uh, and, helps kind and, of control organized colonies as well. Um, well, yes, I guess that's it, where it, it originally, yeah. there was definitely yeah. <laughs> The British history. Mean Time and all that, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, I the, the GMT the uh, for timing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I understand. I understand what yeah. you're saying. This is. That was once upon a time, and and I think now uh, with the Commonwealth, we're perhaps in a different position. And uh, but the thing is, it's about precisely define uh, standards or are, are, are take the concrete industry. British standards are 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 the base rules by which, for example, many cement companies in the UAE are very proud to say that we respect BS one eight eight one, which is a standard mm. test for cement. And, and this goes into, uh, you know, for various industries, because a lot of care has been taken to define what is the good practice, how it should be done properly. And then you can sell the standard. Now, the Japanese have their own GIS, Japanese, or the American ASTM, American Standards. Mm. It's, it's something which is a tool to work. And the advantage is it doesn't, it's not an obligation. It's a bit like ISO 9001. Nine, nine, uh, 9, mm. You have the choice yeah. to to have your company being accredited and have the label ISO 9001, which gives you uh, a good reputation. It gives it makes your clients want to work with you because they know that you've been through a rigorous uh, process of proving yeah. that what you're doing follows some rules. That's what I mean. Yeah. By and in terms of these AI standards, um, do we know what standards it would like technically speaking? what it would standardize like is it the training labeling or um yeah, yeah w what exactly would the standard well, for, be proposed for a start yeah. um i think i think uh, the standards do not exist as far as i know mm. but the one the first, first thing they would need to to tackle our biases in algorithm towards gender, mm. race, sexuality, religion, and whatever you name it. I mean, these were there, there should be a rule that you cannot mm. uh, in uh, you cannot insert in the algorithm, for example, for kids um, uh, promoting uh, one ideology or one uh, religion or, or one sec you know uh, racial mm. bias uh, without telling first uh, declaring you know. Uh, well, that's uh, who creates what is another topic, but you need to to have standards of how you program. And in fact, um, the NHS has a very good mm -hmm. AI text about the values they want to see in their algorithm. Uh, that that's it's exa exemplary. As a matter of fact, they they are pioneers. All the 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 ministry Ministry of Defense. I mean, there are fifteen pages. Um, um, you know, white paper on AI and the principle they use. It's not yet standards, but it's. It's they, everybody is trying to define what is the good, you know, what are the good ways to practice something. It's a bit like the rules of the game, uh, yeah. of the game. And and if there are no rules, then everybody can do anything, and and there are abuses and crimes. And yeah. but I suppose, uh, Christian, that there's kind of two things that I think would be interesting in in that context. That there's a lot of pushback against social media companies like Google and Facebook about how they influence their users and how they either 
people on the platform can influence them or they themselves influence them. And that can be political, ideological, commercial, yeah. whatever. So there's this loss of trust in big kind of private or even government institutions. And at the same time, there's a sort of anti-globalism kind of going on where people are pushing back against IMF, against EU and Dutch farmers and all the rest of it, right? So we, we seem to kind of having this loss of faith in anything big, big oil, big tech, whatever. And also this kind of, well, we don't want to be part of the global system. We want to be away from it because we don't trust the decisions that those guys make work at a national. So how, how does this come together with, with those <laughs> themes going on? Because it's yeah, very, very difficult to be doing. And a, right. a lot of wisdom and a lot of uh, balance. Uh, you know, uh, judgment is about it, being able to balance a very complex set, complex set of data. And and this is why, it's in the, for example, in, in justice, it's reserved to highly trained professionals who struggle very often, even after f several decades of, of, of judging how to judge something. In fact, m one of my close cousins, is a high judge, a former high judge in this country, and he was telling me that even after four or five full decades of, of ju judging in the high court, there were cases where he needed to consult his colleagues because it's extremely difficult. And I think this is generally the path of humanity. We, we have an enormous problem in balancing things. You just need to look what's going on in, this, in, you know, in Israel and Palestine today. No matter what, it's a human disaster. Whatever, whoever is right on one side or on the other and so on, the situation is a nightmare and so many innocents died for it. People who had not a clue about the political situation on either side because some were on holidays like many tourists or many locals. And it's a failure of ours to be able to, to, to talk and to find mm. and, and then now it will bring more hate, more resentment, more extremism, and it's an endless wheel of destruction. And it, it's, it's very sad. So, but the history, of, of, of the, the, the current course of, of humanity, even the United States. I mean, if I was going to say something to the United States, you want to lead, well, lead in kindness. And, you know, and, and that's not forgetting about USAID. USAID does a lot of things, and even including its use for political reasons. We know all of this. But I think uh, civilizations right now should consider and think in global terms. I mean, we, there is no more boundaries. Uh, you could be in Jakarta, you could be, you know, across the planet. It doesn't matter. Intelligence is distributed. And this is what the, those who favor blockchain and love blockchain like mm. it because it decentralizes everything. And because the Bitcoin, no matter what, is the first decentralized payment system where, you know, you can, apart from uh, the fiat, and that is a currency where mm. you, I pay you, you pay me. Uh, it's the first time that we don't need a middle per a middle bank, middle man to be able to, to you know, send money from A to B. And this is what the world asks. But on the other hand, if it wasn't for Google and, 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 and Microsoft, I could not have done my job today because I'm mm -hmm. very grateful to them for, for having created what they're creating and, and developing what they're developing and making it free, freely available. That's the amazing yeah. thing. I suppose it's an interesting question about globalism benefiting people like in Africa, in Latin America, where they have unstable economies, a globalized crypto marketplace allows them to spend and save, etc. versus globalism where some shadowy, unaccountable globalist <laughs> organizations control everyone. And kind of how we, how we make the former work rather than the latter becoming the, the sort of reality, which is a sort of dystopian worldview that sort of people have. <laughs> it's, as I said earlier on, we were talking about the ancient civilization and the back and forth movement. It's, mm. it's a pendulum. We go from one extreme to another constantly and not doing always the right thing one way or another. But there is a progress. I mean, for, uh, President Roosevelt, Roosevelt once said in a language which is now outdated, um, you can try to stop civilization, uh, civilization, but you cannot prevent it to evolve or something of the like. The like. You, you, you can, yeah, you mm. can slow down, you can delay it, but you can't prevent it to evolve. And by civilization, of course, in those, uh, at that time, the notion of civilization had the, you know, colonialist, you know, side to it, and the, the mentalities mm. were different. Yeah, course, but fundamentally, yeah. it's mm. it's true. It's true. It's exactly that. And I, I like yeah. the fact that in England, for yeah. example, in the UK, the diversity of, of, of nations mm. living in this country make create such a, a richness. I mean, I live I live in in a part in West London where we have every every nation of the world is here from every culture, 
And it's and, and I tell you what, Polish supermarkets are fabulous. If you've never been into a Polish supermarket, just go there. <laughs> and you know, they're very serious. They're not the people who smile much. And that's my Polish friends mock themselves about the fact that they have an Eastern uh, attitude towards life, which is very different. But there, are supermarkets are fabulous, and I'm so <laughs> great and so happy we have Poles in this country, for example. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. Um, I wanted to ask you, Christian, what's your current thoughts on crypto and blockchain, basically? Because it obviously, it still, for me, it feels that it hasn't left the the lab in a lot of ways in terms of mass adoption, in terms of real usage. Like there were a lot of promises, obviously, the Bitcoin standard and and you know the the white paper written by Satoshi um, more than a decade ago now is, is is clearly remarkable in terms of the technology and the complexity of it and the idea of it, right? But I think and you saw like a quite a like two crypto booms, you know, uh, basically in the last eight years, basically four years apart. The recent one during the pandemic when everyone was sitting at home. Um, and, and buying a lot of NFTs and, and, and Bitcoins and, and all that sort. And most of the NFT and, and the, the Bitcoin and folks were like, oh, this is a hedge against inflation. You know, it's, it's great. Yada, yada, yada. So much promises. But then now everything's down. Crypto has gone again. It's a wash, basically. Um, no one, you know, I've got a bit of portfolio and it's like, I'm not even looking at it. I'm so ashamed of it. You know, it's all in the red <laughs> basically right now. Right. So what's your sort of current thoughts right now on where this is and where it's going basically, um, in terms well, of crypto and blockchain? Yeah. Again, the, I, I'm fortunate to, to be a historian or part historian yeah. having a, uh, a, mm. a very wide view of the, of yeah. money. I mean, that's I, amazing. Yeah, uh, uh, I, uh, this year in in at Spink in London, something which most Egyptologists, if many all Egyptologists, didn't notice is that there was the first coin ever minted in ancient Egypt in gold sold at Spink with a, mm -hmm. an ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic term for gold, and mm -hmm. it was made by Pharaoh Nikhtanebo the second. Uh, at the time when he was in contact with the Greeks. And I, I, I immediately snatched the catalog, if not to look at it. And, and because it's the birth, it was the birth of a new system to pay things. Till then, ancient Egyptian was, uh, economy was functioning with barter. You give me two, you know, I don't know, two fishes, I give you, uh, you know, mm, something yeah. else and, and, and so on and everything. They had their own measure and it was called the Deben and, and, and there had also other, uh, measures, uh, but till then it was exchange barter, and then suddenly the Greek come with their coins, which they, you know, God knows who had the idea first, and I'm sure that's a, a debate. And then it evolves, it evolves across time. It takes so many forms, and and you may not be aware, for example, that Sir Isaac Newton who was actually the director of the mint in this country, and 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 that's be, be uh, you know first he wrote his Principia Mathematica in Cambridge and then and that the other a great work he would publish eighteen years later but in between he was given the governorship at the Tower of London of the Mint and he he actually restructured the machines and he recalled all the money of England so that they couldn't be filed I think he put crenellation around so that people could not uh, uh, file the silver because it was the, the, the English coins were were filed and then the silver was transformed in Europe in other coins and it was used to buy, you know, UK coins, which were, and then at that point it was a revolution. I mean, the king was so grateful to Sir Isaac for doing this because he restructured the economy. Now with Bitcoin, mm. um, it's again the pendulum. If you have bought some Bitcoins in 2017, like when I started to be in this industry, you know, it was 1000 pound a Bitcoin at the time, 1000 euro. And today, it, no matter what, it's still 22,000 or something, 24,000. Mm, I haven't looked yeah. at the latest price. It's, it, it was a, a very good investment. Now it goes up, it goes down. But what's important is that the system exists. Some states have, have started to adopt it as a, an alternative national currency. There's not a week when you, can, you don't hear that a, a new usage of the Bitcoin, mm. particularly with other cryptos, is being made. So we need to take some distance. It seems close. Mm. Yes, there are been crashes of the Bitcoin and a lot of people lost, lost a lot of money. But if we take some distance, the question is, where will cryptocurrencies evolve? 
So mm. some say central bank, you know, GBDCs and they say, you know, yeah. the central bank cryptocurrency. It's very difficult to, to, to know. But in my opinion, the point about cryptocurrencies is that they're decentralized and that mm. gives people in the remotest part of Africa a capacity to ex not do barter anymore, but really yeah. have uh, some some uh, 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 the power to buy something with something that someone else across the globe is using. If you're mm. in Tanzania today and you've got some bitcoins, you can send them to Laos or 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 China. Well, that is new. No matter what, that is new. And and they're catching. I mean, the Tanzanian, for example, uh, internet network. I mean, you can be in a safari in the middle of nowhere and you can actually talk to someone in London as if. As if you know you, you you're just a few yards or a few hundreds of meters away. They there we don't realize that Tanzania has better road system apparently than the UK now in terms of quality, and and that's because the Africans are evolving. Nobody notices. There's so many African countries that mm. to keep up with uh, what everybody else is doing. Or which is the first government in the world which has really successfully uh, who successfully used and is using a blockchain at national level level? The Philippines. The Philippines have the best citizen blockchain national system in the world with uh, every Filipino citizen has on his telephone all the administrative um, uh, requirement that that person needs to do uh, uh, for whatever reason is on one single app connected to the government. And they're leading. They're giving us lessons about how to use the blockchain technology. And do you think people notice? No. M most... Uh, most people, what I'm saying right now is ignored by like 95% you know, mm. of people mm. across the world, if not more. It's, it's yeah. quite interesting because we had um, the authors who wrote uh, Why Nations Fail on, on the podcast mm. previously, and they talked about inclusive versus exclusive institutions. And a lot of these mm. developing countries struggle because their governments and banks are exclusive, as in they kind of yeah. do for their benefit and not for them, right? Whereas it seems like blockchain and crypto is kind of transforming the society from the ground up, right? Where you can circumvent exactly. these these corrupt institutions. Fascinating. Yeah, it, it's exactly that. It's it's empowering people, everybody, to do something. I mean, banks. Well, you look at the history of banks from the Rothschilds to to, to now, and and it's always uh, once you occupy a monopoly. This is what the Rothschilds occupied after the Battle of Waterloo. We know how they made their money, and 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 and, and you know. Uh, enjoyed it for quite a long time and being even sitting on the board of the Bank of England for quite a long time. Uh, of course, if you're in a position of dominance and monopoly, you will uh, reap the, the position of power you have. But if you, the, the thing, what banks don't like precisely is that the power is distributed to everybody and that everyone mm. can, I mean, French banks are, 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 have lived in France so many years are, are terrible as a matter of fact for that. And they're in the eighties, nineties and early in 2000 were hit on the fingers by the president of France himself. Some very often saying, you know, you can't keep abusing customers like this. You need to have better standards. You cannot just put, you know, interest on any wrong action that any one of us does. I mean, this is what's still the system right now. And, and, and well, if you can bypass this by any way, uh, of course, the, the, it's not going to make a lot of people happy, but it's going to make millions of others extremely happy. Yeah. The world is evolving. We, I think connectivity and the, cap the capacity to exchange, whether it's money or ideas, is the future. It's, it's exactly that. Uh, yeah. The, the yeah. world is shrinking. We really can talk to each other at the speed and, and the quality of image like what we're doing right now. It's a miracle of technology. We were getting accustomed to it. <laughs> I've seen a, an Englishman a few days ago when I was talking to my wife on, 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 you know, with WhatsApp, having his eye open, he literally open, even though he is, he is more, well, he's, he was in his 80s. He had never seen it before. And it's, it's <laughs> still, we take it for granted because we're in, in the technology world, we were always after the latest technologies. Mm. But a lot of people in this country have not a clue of how to use WhatsApp. My, you know, my mother struggles to use an Android phone. She just cannot call me. It's too complicated. So, mm. I I, I, just, just another question I had was: I mean, there, there's some, there's people like Peter Thiel, for example, who kind of says 
actually we're innovating less now than we were before because oh. electricity was a much bigger thing than the internet, for example, right? Um, where do you think this current crop of technologies, you know, metaverse, AI, blockchain ranks in sort of, you know, are these as big, are, are these as transformative as electricity, for example? Yes. Or are they, right, yeah, internet. Okay. Yes. It's, it's others, part yeah. of the evolution of the world. There, mm. Whether it's Web 1, Web 2, Web 3, or whether it's, it's electricity, uh, machines, uh, first computers, and now AI, and, and so on, so on, we are witnessing uh, the, 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 the century of enlightenment extending to a point. You know, during the century of enlightenment, all these machines appear, automation, uh, weaving machines. I'm a, I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, I should know, because because we, we've been at the forefront of, of machine developments, improving society and industrial revolution, like perhaps no other society in, the, in, in, in this uh, country. And I'm very proud to be a part of it because I like the idea that we're trying to do something new. And myself, I, I, I was the first person to, to hash a printed book and put it on the blockchain to protect the IP. And the RSA made an article. And I never thought in my life that I would actually make an innovation like this. But this is part of of improvement and i'm not sure but most people don't get why would we uh, hash to you know transform the entire content of a book in an algorithm what's the point well you can go to court and say that you know the intellectual property that is the content of the book was mine at a given time and and i can prove that but technology it needs not only to be developed but understood it's not because we as technologists understand how something works that people follow they don't they they most people still struggle with their phone when they have a phone and many people i hear don't want to hear about the phone because they're my, my someone i know who is who lives in nearby uh, you know was telling me I, I i was happier in the 70s and the 80s when i was young when we had no telephone it's too <laughs> there's too much technology in our lives in fact, I, I've been saying that the best technologies are those which we don't see or don't, or don't use. I mean, we use our, our phones much more. It should be much more easy and, to, 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 and much more discreet. Um, I, and I, can, I, I wrote an article that there's nothing that can beat the beauty of a garden. I mean, and, and you know, uh, in, in, of course, it's an extreme statement, but we have a long way to go to emulate nature and be able to have the grace and elegance and beauty and harmony of a garden created by nature, whether we are in it or not. And our phones are, may, uh, an iPhone may be very beautiful but, <laughs> and very simple, but it's, it's, uh, I've rarely seen anyone putting it uh, in a frame and on, on, on the wall, you know, like the, the painting I have here. We, we, it's a, it's a sort of, you see the corner of a Tuscany uh, landscape. Well, it gives us pleasure every day. I don't think my, my wife's iPhone gives her really great pleasure every day, even though she paid too much for it, in my opinion. <laughs> but that's an, not everybody would, would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is the effects of technology, right? On our on our soul, on our minds, and our bodies. And like where, where I sort of um, disagree in a lot of ways with Peter Thiel is that uh, you know, it, it, you sometimes you need a bit of incremental innovation just for society and humans to catch up before radical innovations uh, come in. You know, it's actually better to have incremental, 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 then radical. You know, then incremental, 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 then again radical. You know, so you're like a bit kind of catching it's up, or else you're you're you, yeah, oh, super <laughs> chaotic. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so it's, I think it's always like a chicken and egg problem, right? When it comes to human society and laws catching up to technology, basically um, too much of that. And you basically, um, you know, kill the baby in the cradle, you know, in a lot of ways, like what Europe is doing with AI and too less of that. And you now you, you find it hard to adapt in a lot of ways. Um, but I think um, it's been an hour and uh, I would like to start, you know, wrapping up. It is uh, getting late. I wanted to ask you before we go, uh, Christian, so I saw in your website that you're doing some interesting things at Projectus where you guys are building some proprietary tech um, in, in relation to classification knowledge and philosophy of the internet. Like, are you able to share on so what, what are the scope of some of these proprietary did, tech? Did and you mention how it can help? I did, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I just well, read it on your website, uh, the classification a long time ago, of knowledge. I yeah. created a, yeah. what many people consider the best classification of sciences in, in, in history of oh, mankind. Interesting. And, and nobody cares. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I belong to the most exclusive club and maybe one of the most prestigious in history. Plato was one, uh, uh, was, uh, one of the 
first game. Yeah. So Jeremy Bentham was another. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's like posthumous. Nobody you know? cares except the Wikipedia page and a few specialist uh, scholars who, who actually say that classification of sciences is one of the most esoteric and difficult topic in, in, in the world. But I might use it now with AI to, to actually mm, yeah. structure things. But, but it's always like everything, you know, there's a, a use. Um, as I said, um, I have my own blockchain since uh, 24 mm. hours. It's a very simple blockchain, but it will be connected to the certification system I've developed for companies to certify documents and uh, at, mm. uh, you know, five different levels. Um, yeah, it's it's about trying to develop applications which are useful and and you know AI is more my my public service. I've been I've been uh, almost six years in in Parliament mm. uh, talking about mm. the ethics of AI. I never got one penny, and I mentioned it until a few weeks ago. And then suddenly someone <laughs> came and offered me a, a job, you know, as a judge for for an AI competition. But otherwise, uh, no, because it's not, I, I'm on the blockchain side. You know, the, the lockdown mm. has delayed many projects, including one that I had with the police to catch a certain type of criminals. Um, yeah, mm. lockdown and, and COVID has been very destructive from that point of view, but uh, maybe for the best. And and now everything, as I said, projectives consultants, I've already s sent the papers to companies' house to change the name of the companies from projectives consultants to projectives technologies and consulting. And then the announcement will be made on LinkedIn anytime because once we have our first client, I will, I will consider that uh, for the, the major technology we've developed, which is of another order than the small blockchain I developed myself. But I think it will, the fact that when people are going to learn that with mm. Python and PyCharm, I've actually been able to code my own blockchain and see it function on projectis.co.uk, which is uh, the website mm. of my company. It's, it's, it's much better for them to understand that I don't only talk about blockchain or have theoretical design views. Like, for example, I design yeah. Secure Stamp, uh, Stamp Secure, um, uh, Secure Stamp, sorry. Uh, I designed the architecture, which was very quickly coded by a professional. A professional. Yeah. But it's a different mm. thing for them to know that I actually coded my own blockchain, even if it's not a blockchain, with mm. uh, which it, it doesn't require the level... Of, of technicity that some gigantic blockchains like Ethereum and others have. Yeah. For me, it's about certifying and recording the certification mm. of, of blockchain hashes for documents. So we're talking of another order uh, of, of technology. Yes, that's, uh, really cool that's, yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool, actually. And uh, yeah, looking forward to um, some of your some, some of your work. There is one question I had in mind, and probably this will be our last question, but since your um, your family has been so much involved in statecraft, I, I sort of thought yeah. that I'd have to ask this. So, you know how for ancient civilizations you basically had um, sort of nomad nomadic people, right? And then nomadic people kind of settle down. They form sort of communities, you know, tribes or, or communal. And then throughout the Middle Ages um, and even until the sort of like Enlightenment period, you had the empires, right? The Ottoman Empire, the Austria-Hungarians, the French, the British Empire, and sort of that sort of collapsed um, and balkanized into the nation state, the concept of nation state, you know, the, the Republic of Armenia, the Republic of Bangladesh, the Republic of Pakistan, this and that, whatever. Um, and now, I don't, know, I don't know if you've read the book and, and the works of Balaji Srinivasan, you know, who recently came up with this book called The Network State, you know, where people on the internet can actually um, kind of create states, basically, you know, by, because we share the same ideals, we share the same thinking, so we can um, sort of kind of get money, you know, um, together, raise money together, and land comes last, you know, but the the idea that the blockchain and other sort of consensus mechanisms enables us to create sort of states in the network you know so where do you see sort of statecraft going towards so this whole evolution from like hunter gatherers nothing nomadic people all the way to network states on the internet basically like do you have uh, any sort of uh, thoughts there yeah i mean what you're asking is about the evolution of, of statehood Mm, yeah, to correct. understand where yeah. uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rather important question. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy we're finishing with this. 
Um, <laughs> we know that someone has already created a passport. Um, there is an organization which has created a blockchain, a decentralized passport for, for okay. an, an international ID, which has nothing to do with states and which would give an ID. I can't remember the name of it. I mean, sometimes you have pioneers, you have people who have a vision and of course, and I think their ID is using by the United Nation, perhaps for refugee camps or something like that. But the sure thing is that's all it's, it's we're at, um, at the beginning of what may follow, uh, in the very, you know, way we conceive this world and, and Mm. Uh, in Europe, it's already a, a problem for many European citizens who are of multiple citizenship, European citizenship. They don't feel entirely French, entirely Italian, entirely Spanish, but they feel mm. European. Correct. And, and Europe yeah. will have to upgrade one at one point or another to a European passport. With a bit, in, in ancient times, you know, in the Ottoman Empire, you couldn't go from one city to another without a, what was called a teskere, which was a passport to travel from one place to another, and there were controls everywhere. Thank God in Turkey, and it doesn't exist anymore. But what I'm mm. saying is that we are taking boundaries down. John Lennon, in his famous song, refers to that. Can you imagine a world without boundaries? And I, I perfectly can. And <laughs> I think it would bring peace. And I think it would be, uh, allow people to have less conflicts and in, in, and in this respect. But think about Palestine. I mean, uh, no matter, you know, Palestinians have their share of responsibility, what's going on in Israel too, but the confining 2.3 million in such a small, you know, uh, uh, you know, part of the world and having a wall around it is a, is a rather uh, inhuman way of whatever reasons for whatever led the Israelis to do that it's in and and it's not right we it shouldn't be like this you can't prevent people to travel you can't prevent them to move but there are as i said responsibilities on you know we could endlessly debate this but but it's just a principle it's not right to the the berlin wall for example i mean we're so happy it was taken down ultimately Walls or the Mexican wall that Mr. Trump wants to build in Mexico. It's wrong. It's, it's completely wrong. When uh, on top of that, the United States is made of migrants. It's, it's not right. You should allow people to, to express themselves, to travel, you know, to go from one place to another. And, and if you don't, then you, you just marginalize people. You prevent them to evolve and we deprive ourselves of, of talents as well. I mean, I suppose it becomes a question of rather than what is the right politics for this piece of land, it's sort of politics, community, whatever becomes detached from land and it kind of just becomes across the world almost. And it, there, there's a former prime minister of Australia and he was explaining sort of Brexit and stuff. And he said it's it's a conflict in his mind between the somewheres and the anywheres, sort of people who can live anywhere and people who have to live somewhere and, and the sort of division that's arising because of that and i suppose what you're talking about is we sort of bring the somewheres into anywheres and anyone kind of benefits from that is sort of the direction of travel if you like well migration is and uh, immigration is a uh, is an extremely difficult topic it's one of the most difficult which you know but we take it you know take the example of gabon for example, which really got fed up with the French for not allowing Gabonese citizens to travel to France and get visas. So what did they do? <clears throat> From one day to another, they slammed the door of the Francophonie and told the French not only to, you know, go somewhere else, but uh, that they would switch to the English language from one day to another. So, so powerful were their, uh, uh, you know, their fair resentment that they, French people could come to Gabon, Gabonese could not go the, the opposite direction. You, <clears throat> you have to put yourself in the shoes, you know, you know, everybody. But, but it, of course, it's a difficult with the, we see the migration flow, you know, uh, movements across Europe, which are a headache for, for, for politicians. It's, it's not an easy topic. It's not easy. And the world is not a fair place. And not everybody can travel fairly. And, and, you know, and, and, and in visas are not given. Most citizens in Europe don't realize that for many countries, for, for, for them to come to Europe, consulates don't always give, uh, uh, you know, visas. And this was the case for Armenia. When I was living in Armenia for, for years, I could see that many Armenians were not allowed to travel to France, for example, on, on a variety of reasons. And then it changed. And then when the French state realized that the Armenians would just wanted to come and go back, most of them, 
then things it's a question of understanding the other allowing you know the prosperity of one country i mean the the, the tactic for armenia was we're going to make them we're going to make armenia a better place until such time as armenians don't want to leave armenia so many mm-hmm. because many left and in a way this is what happened and then and then thing you know visas were given more easily but a lot of people when i was telling people in europe that you know armenians can't come and travel to europe so easily the, their eyes were wide open we don't realize you know this sort of thing politicians don't talk about uh, very easily because it's embarrassing but on the other hand you can't if you can't open your borders and and welcome everybody in in five minutes either so it's extremely complex it's an evolution but ultimately yeah. you do not leave your country you do not leave your home and your your house and your village if you're happy about your country mm. and and you you prosperous and many people ask me because i come from an, a, a, you know the nobility the army nobility and on the other hand my grandfather created a republic but because we also understood that the system the a kingdom was not possible and when people ask me which is the best system between a monarchy or constitutional monarchy mm. or republic my answer is very simple it's the system that makes people happy prosperous and, and secure or mm. and you can put it in the yeah. reverse order the best it's like a black cat white cat whatever catches mice yeah mm. yeah and yeah that's I think what it's a big shot ping and yeah, this yeah. is why he's a fa- he was a founding father one of the founding fathers of the republic of armenia even mm. though he was a nobleman he decided to create a republic because he, mm. he had the interest of armenians at heart before you know the privileges that he could get as a as a as a nobleman if a, some king of armenia was uh, or kingdom was recreated that's it's it's about whether you care about people or you, or you don't whether you care about mm. their 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 you know welfare i mean if you can't make them happy at least make mm. them prosperous and secure and this yeah. is what a lot of politicians don't understand so the system is almost irrelevant it's a question how much you achieve how far do you go into achieving making this economy in this country today uh, prosperous when we're we're going to see now the brexit uh, treaties you know taking you know being implemented in 2024 I, I, we're going to get another shock I'm, I'm almost sure another economic shock. Mm. So what are we going to do for that? What are we going to do for the northern part of England or the people who haven't got uh, access to as much money as there is in London and are, are, are separated from, mm. the, are, are removed from the possibility of finding, you know, better jobs? It's it's going to be hard. And and that's what the politicians need to answer. It doesn't matter which party you are. You should be taking care of people. And that's valid for the rest of the world. This is why giving to other countries for them to be prosperous is a good thing. but it needs to be done in an intelligent way otherwise it people pocket it and go away with it and and spend it in you know, spend it in um, in in incredible uh, ways uh, you know I, I, right now i'm thinking about this uh, vatican bishop who, who was discovered having a villa in 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 brazil which he had funded with the the money from the children's hospital of milan of, of which he had the responsibility okay this is this is a bolder comp- funny i mean it's it's fun it's terrible on the other hand it's so grotesque and and extreme that you think some people will not you know um prevent mm. themselves or restrain themselves from doing the most horrendous things in this life for their own uh, their own you know private uses but o- overall this you know politicians across the world have the responsibility of making the nation wealth prosperous you know wealthy and if possible happy a big task Yeah. I, I think I think one thing that definitely comes from you Christian is is this optimism that you know we mm-hmm. we've had challenges and yes it could go bad but we've been through difficult periods and actually I think you you are optimistic in tone about the future of technology and that we will find a way to make this work for our benefit right uh, I'm more realistic actually I I tend um it's a bit like what's happening in in Armenia right now Um mm. I had forecasted almost every step all the way to the end including the very date at which the Azeris would attack and and people didn't consult me. I tried to say that several times and people don't mm. always listen to what you say. Like they didn't listen to my father when he told the prime minister of Lebanon in nine, in, in the 1950s that the country would go uh you know would be divided and then probably a bloodbath and he was dismissed. Um if you don't but but uh, listening is a difficult thing and and on which basis why would you s- listen to one person or another this is where judgment comes so it's exact we are going back to to what we we're talking about science originally where is the border between credibility and and incredulity or or of fantasy 
It's, mm. This is where human beings, you are here, both of you asking me one of the most interesting set of questions I've been asked in my lifetime, if not the most interesting <laughs> set of questions, because Incredible. you actually are looking at it from from a, a overall point of view. We are, you are trying to make sense of the world in which we are and whether your background you know, and your origin have nothing to do with the issue. I could be Serbo Croat, you could be Swedish, even though you don't look like it, to be, to be fair. <laughs> but the fact is, it's, it's about trying to make sense of, of human condition uh, in co in trying to understand why civilizations and religions have different points of view and trying to unite this as opposed to divide. And people, if, if you ask me, how, what do I think about the evolution of the United States? Well, the pessimistic of, uh, part of me would say, well, considering that human beings have a tendency to division, we could probably forecast that the union will split at one point or another. And then the optimistic part of me would think, well, maybe with technology, knowledge, welfare, and new, you know, new energy resources, and understanding that we cannot allow people not to have access to health systems and 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 you know uh, uh, medical care. Uh, well, if this is understood, we might avoid some some dramatic social. Uh, disturbances and 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 basically you can sum the whole thing in, in in very simply if we are not kind to each other and if we don't try to empathize with people everywhere across the globe we're not gonna we're gonna go nowhere we, we're gonna have uh, more wars more divisions more more bloodbath like, like we're seeing in Israel and Palestine and it really saddens me I'll tell you I mean uh, uh, what happened Israelis were on the Azeri side and uh, you know gave weapons to to the the Azeris to crush the Armenians but mm. I, I still feel that it's terrible what happened to them and that the Palestinians should not have done something like this but then the Palestinians would argue but yes but and it goes yeah. on like that so we need to talk to our enemies and respect our enemies and sit down at the table of our enemies because it's the only solution and I've been I've been asking for the Armenians to talk to the Turks for a long long time because it's mm. the only way, the only way you can end this. My family has waged war for 300 years in Garabakh, imagine, or more. Mm. So we, we know about the, 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 you know, the endless, and it's depressing to see that in 2023, what my ancestor was doing in 1723, and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's exactly the same. Yeah. And, and the famous wars of David Beg, every Armenian could tell you about, mm. uh, about it. And yeah, we were fighting at the time against Turkey. Where does it stop? How, mm. how, you know, where, where does it end? It's a constant, um, you know, endless, um, uh, you know, for, uh, his, we see history repeating itself constantly yeah. in the wrong way in that direction. So let's try to make it uh, a, a better way. And like Mr. President Obama was saying, there's a right side of history and the wrong side of history in a simplistic way, but there was a point there. You, do you mm. want to believe? Do you want to be part of a world where every nation, every culture is under one roof, or do we want to continue because this one is of this religion and the other one is this culture to divide ourselves? No, it's it's not right. It's it will never bring peace. We'll never be happy like this. And in the meantime, we we'll destroy the planet because nobody. In the, it, everybody talks about Ukraine, but I don't tell you about the ecological devastations that all this, this shedding is doing across the countryside. We don't care about the animals. We don't care about the insects. There's no importance whatsoever. You know, we, we people don't think about yeah. this. Yeah, so, that, it's a question of consciousness. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like a pendulum in a lot of ways. Um, history, like you said, basically, right. Um, but, um, uh, it's been great having you Christian and, uh, I think, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of end it there. Maybe we should have another one of these sessions, you know, maybe offline as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's let's certainly meet, been let's a true pleasure. Let's have a, yeah. let's have a tea. Uh, uh, I think that would be amazing. We could spend an entire afternoon just talking about Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. also, let's try to do something that has an impact yeah. because Absolutely. whatever we do, if it has, it doesn't change anything, then it's just, yeah. In the talk. Absolutely. Yeah, agreed. But thank Brilliant. you for having me, and it's been uh, very interesting, I must say, from my part. A bit very Brilliant. different from what I usually do in this sort yeah. of uh, podcast. Which, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I'm yeah. asked about technology, I'm asked about Egyptology, but this yeah. lies at another altitude. Combines and all those worlds together. Actually, really, yeah. Really does. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant. I'm sure the listeners are going to have a good time as well. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. All right. Thank you both and uh, have a great time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Brilliant.